Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Before we get started, let me remind you that Brother Randy Greer will be here coming up on May 7th, 8th, and 9th. That's a Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. We'll have two meetings each day at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. So be sure to come, mark that down, tell people, and come. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, or literally, rejoice. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, you have to know something in order to be successful in the life of a Christian. You have to know something. You know, the Bible says, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. For lack of knowledge, good men have gone into captivity. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, you have to know that the trial of your faith works or produces patience. The word trying of your faith is often translated proving. The proving of your faith. It comes as a shock to some Christians when their faith fails because their faith had not been tested and proven. I'm reminded of Jerry O'Dell. Jerry O'Dell was the son-in-law of T.L. Osborne, and he traveled with T.L. for many, many years. And he would go ahead of T.L. to the nations where they were going to have a crusade. And he would go from village to village, say, in Africa, with a, in a Jeep with a movie projector, a screen, and a generator. And he would show videos, movies, the old movies, of previous T.L. Osborne crusades. And let people know what was going to happen, and they would see videos of thousands of people being healed. And then they would come to the Crusades. Well, he eventually left working with T.L. and became an instructor at Rama Bible Training Center. And uh, he was an instructor when I was there. And he taught a class called Angels and Demons. And he told the story of how he took a group of first-year students who, in the summer between their first and second year, he took them to Guatemala for a crusade. And, of course, he did just like he had seen T.L. do for years and years and years. He preached the gospel. And then he gave a call for people to receive Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord. He did that, and then he invited everyone who had also been healed to come up on the platform and testify. And no one came. And the students were behind him on the platform, and he heard them murmuring. And he turned around, and he looked at them, and he pointed his finger, and he said, I've been over this bridge before. It'll hold the weight. In other words, he had proved his faith. And then again, he told the people to come, and many that had been healed came. If you're going to live a victorious life, you have to prove your faith. In the parable of the seed and the sower... Jesus said the sower went forth to sow the seed and some fell by the wayside and of course nothing happened. Some fell among stony ground. Some fell among the thorns. But some fell in the good ground. 
Well, it was only the good ground that produced a harvest. And Luke 8, 15 sums it up this way. It says, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. So your heart is the ground. They which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word... You can't have faith without hearing the word. Having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. It is only those who have patience that bring forth fruit. The only ground that produced and continued to produce fruit, you know, some did not bring any fruit to perfection. <clears throat> was that which was patient. Patience. We do not give patience its due because the world doesn't give patience its due. The Bible does, doesn't it? It says, let patience have its perfect work. They heard the word, kept it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Verse 4. So you have to look back, back up to verse 3. You have to know that the trial of your faith is worth something. Peter says it's more precious than gold. Most people would say, give me the gold. Come on. But Peter said, give me the trial. Verse 4. Verse 4, 5, 6, and 7 all contain a commandment. Now think about this. The Holy Spirit, of course, gave these words to James, and James was not ashamed to make some commandments. Not many preachers have the boldness to give a commandment. James did. All four of these verses have a commandment. And in the Greek, you didn't have to say, I'm commanding you. They had a tense for that. It's called the imperative tense. Verse 4 is not only an imperative tense, a commandment, but is to do something continuously. It says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you know to be patient today and impatient tomorrow will get you nothing? Huh? We are commanded to continuously be patient. Let patience have its free. That means you've got to be patient. Continuous. We are commanded to never be impatient. If you're commanded to always be patient, then you must also be commanded to never be impatient. Yeah, but. That's not there. It doesn't say unless. But let patience, we're commanded to have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 5, now these next two verses are commandments, but they're not to do something continuously. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, that's a commandment, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of a sea, driven and tossed by the wind. You ever been in the wave of the sea, you know, on our honeymoon? <laughs> For some ridiculous reason, one of the places we went was the Outer Banks of North Carolina. You know why they call them the Outer Banks? Because they ain't the Inner Banks. <laughs> And it wasn't sand there, it was rocks, rocky. 
And the winds were so bad, if you went out there, it actually filled my swimming trunks with rocks. <laughs> now that's not good. I thought I was going to drown. In fact, Colette went back to the room. I thought she had drowned. <laughs> and I'm looking for her. Tossed by the sea. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of a sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose, now that's a commandment, but it's in the negative. In other words, you're not commanded to do something, you're commanded to not do something. Never suppose that that man who doubts will receive anything from the Lord because he's double-minded and he's unstable in all of his ways. Let patience have its perfect work. It says, but let patience. You know, that, that word is also translated now and then. I like then. Then, so you see, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. Then, see, once you know something, you can have the then. Then, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Then always let your patience, your endurance, have its perfect work. One man described patience this way. He described it as staying power. Staying power. And literally that's what the word means. It means to stay under. Stay under. That's what the word literally means. Then, let, that means allow, permit, agree to, give your consent. You'll get a lot farther going with God in agreement than disagreement. Let God, give God your consent. That means that God Almighty by his Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul gave you a command the International Standard Version, not the New International, which I do not recommend the New International. The International Standard Version says, but you must let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now what actually happens when you stay under or when you let patience have its perfect work? Well, really, it's not patience, it's God. You're letting God perform his perfect work. You're letting the seed grow. Patience isn't doing it. It's you didn't dig it up. So patience is actually you letting God work in you and for you and through you. Amen? It's letting the seed grow. It's God working in you. It's you not interfering with God doing his perfect work. You ever interfered with what God was trying to do? No, of course not. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident. See, we're talking about something very similar here. Knowing this, being confident. See, if you know something, you can be confident in it, right? Knowing this very thing that he who has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus well it'll get there quicker if you cooperate amen Philippians 2 12 therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed or to obey James not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means allow God. Give God your consent. 
Because it's God is the one working in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Notice the next verse, verse 14. Do all things... My goodness, that's a continuous present tense imperative. We are commanded to do all things without murmuring and disputing. You know, the Bible says that everything that happened to the children of Israel happened as an example for us. And if there's one thing you ought to learn when, you know, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt after 400 years because they finally got an agreement to get out you know God heard them and he sent Moses down there to bring them out but if there's anything you ought to learn from their 40 years in the desert was don't murmur and complain can you say amen? Don't murmur and complain. God brought them out of, out of bondage in Egypt to bring them to the land of promise. But instead of cooperating with God, even though all they had done. Now think about that. Think about all God's done in your life and you still sometimes don't cooperate. Huh? Remind yourself where you were and what God did for you. Cooperate with God. If there's anything we need to learn was cooperate with God and don't murmur and complain. Amen? What are we going to do? Rejoice in the Lord always. Amen? God brought them out of bondage in Egypt to bring them into the land of promise. But instead of cooperating with God, they constantly murmured and complained and spread discontent. And only two of them brought fruit to perfection. Joshua and Caleb. Instead of saying we can't, they said we can Instead of talking defeat, they talked victory. Don't talk defeat. David Ingalls has a song that said, For me to fail, God would have to fail, and God cannot fail. Amen. Here's a good example. We just looked. The children of Israel were a bad example, but David was a man after God's own heart. Because David had proved his faith and killed Goliath, <laughs> the king Saul gave him his daughter to be married. He should have said, no, thank you. But of course, you can't say no, thank you to the king. Because his wife was not a prize. But because he married the king's daughter. And became a man of valor and battle. Saul. He was around Saul because he was of his family now. An in-law. And Saul grew jealous and Saul tried to kill him. Remember one day Saul threw a spear at him. David had to run away. And for 10 years, even though he had already been anointed king by Samuel. David had been anointed king. He said, he, so obviously he knew, I'm God's choice, not you. Amen. But for 10 years, he passed up every opportunity to kill Saul. He let God work in him. He let God make him king. Amen? For 10 years. He's been anointed king. And for 10 years, he had to hide and run from Saul. Saul. 
Verse 4 in the Amplified Bible says, Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith brings out endurance, steadfastness, and patience. They, they, they got, got them all there. Be assured, be assured, know this, be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith brings out endurance, steadfastness, and patience. David did not take things into his own hand. David stayed under. God had anointed him. God will promote him. Amen? Let patience have its perfect work. God has chosen to use endurance, patience, and fortitude in the process of our perfecting. You know, in the last days, it's required to be patient. Luke 21, verse 10, says this, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Everybody knows that. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights. And great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. So this is primarily written to the Jews. And prisons, and brought forth before kings and rulers, for my name's sake, written for the Christian Jews, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Uh, uh, what about complaining? Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you they shall cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. You know your soul is going to give you some trouble. Amen? Your mind. Your mind might tell you all kind of crazy things. Then it goes on to say, Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Quit worrying. Quit fretting. Amen? Hebrews 12.1 Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses in heaven, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Murmuring and complaining is one of those sins. And let us run with patience or endurance or steadfastness the race that is set before us. That's in the present tense continuous, and the word patience is emphasized. You're not going to finish your race if you can't endure. And it says, the race that is set before us. How many people run their own race? It's not any race. We're not to just run. We're to run the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus. Look to Jesus. All looked bleak. The multitudes went from following him to, cut, come, to yelling out, crucify him. But he knew the joy that was set before him. Amen. Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of endurance. Same word. King James says endurance. You need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So everything's not instant, is it? I don't think there's probably any McDonald's in heaven. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight. Continuous imperative. Fight the good fight of faith. 
lay hold on eternal life, lay hold on spiritual fortitude, to which you've also been called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, but then it says we are to continuously fight the good fight of faith. So that means the just shall live by fighting the good fight of faith, doesn't it? David Ingalls also used to say a good fight is a fight that you win. Amen? If you don't start fighting until the tenth round, you might lose. Amen? Everybody's familiar with, at least in our camp, 1 Timothy 6, 12. But let's back up and read verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, talking about the love of money before that, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. You've got to follow after something that the world doesn't follow after to fight the good fight of faith. Faith, if, if there's a fight to faith, that means faith has enemies, doesn't it? The first one, he, Paul said, or James said, knowing this. So the first enemy to faith is not knowing. For lack of knowledge, my people perish. Good men have gone into captivity, it says. So not having heard the truth is your first enemy. Not many people have heard, count it all joy. And fewer have believed it. And fewer have done it. We're down to that fourth soil again, aren't we? Huh? Yeah. So not having heard the truth is the first enemy of faith. Another is not having proved your faith. The time to prove your faith is not in Luke when you stand before kings. Because believe me, if you haven't proved it by then, you ain't going to prove it. Not having proved your faith is an enemy of faith. Mother, remember Randy Greer likes to tell the story about, he calls him Dr. J, because he can't pronounce his name. You know, he's an Indian who came to America, went to Rama, and had no money, couldn't work. And so he locked himself in a closet, in the, actually in the bathroom. He lived in the same apartment complex that Randy did. And uh, it was not a real nice place. And he told his wife, I'm not coming out of here till I have faith to be blessed. And he, came, he stayed in there for several days. And his wife said, what if we need to use the bathroom? He said, go to the neighbor's. <laughs> and when he came out he said today I'm going to believe God for one American dollar one dollar and you know what he did he, he gathered up a few pennies not even a dollar and headed to the grocery store on foot and on the way he found a brand new dollar bill he proved his faith. Amen? Randy said today he's a millionaire. But he started out one dollar. Not having proved your faith is an enemy. If you run from every challenge, you're going to fail. You're not prepared to win the fight. Running the wrong race is another enemy of faith. Now listen to this. It says, but let him ask of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Looking to the world for wisdom and answers and direction instead of asking God is an enemy of faith. And not feeding on the word. Abide in me and my word abides in you. So... The trial will do something. It'll do something in you or it'll do to you. Amen? 
It'll do something good in you or it'll do you in. And you may give up, but God is patient. He just says, well, let's start over. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace, the God of peace that brought again Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, brought him again up from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You know your covenant still in effect. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. A lot of people think they arrived when they were born again. That's as dumb as thinking you arrived the day you were born in the natural. Amen. You, you, you did not arrive just because you were born again. You started. You mean like Jethro. The Beverly Hillbilly spent 15 years in the third grade, you know. <laughs> now get out of there. Don't cut the work of God off. Hold on and endure to victory. Don't run from the trial. Don't quit. Don't give up like all the children of Israel. They did. And think about that. They never even faced the enemy. Not one of them was killed by the enemy. By the giants. They died because they quit. Brother Hagin used to say, oh, he said, there was a lot of people better preachers than me, but they quit. They gave up. When the going got tough, they gave up. Don't run from the trial. Embrace it. Don't quit. Instead of saying, God, why me? Say, what are you trying to teach me, God? Do not begin to complain and make negative statements because you know you may have what you say. If you're murmuring and complaining, you are not walking with God. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Murmurs and complainers, they're walking alone till they find other murmurs and complainers. Bible says you're more than a conqueror. Believe it and act like it. Amen. Talk victory, not defeat. As I said, as David Engel said, for me to fail, God would have to fail, and God cannot fail. If God be for you, who can be against you? Well, I don't know who it is, but they're winning. No, they're not winning. <laughs> You will be conformed to the image of Christ if you let God do it his way. Don't tell God how to do it. Ask God what to do. Look at Abraham. Abraham had the promises of God for years and years and years and years. And finally, when his body's dead and his wife's body's dead, as far as producing children, God said, now's the time. Now we're going to do it. Because you can't do it, but I can. God likes to do what you can't do. He said, when I come back this time next year, you're going to have a son named Isaac. And Romans 4.20 says... He did not waver. He was not tossed to and fro. He didn't get out the four-leaf clover and say, God can do it. God can't do it. God can do it. God can't do it. No, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith because he gave glory to God. Amen? Give glory to God. 
Don't give glory to the... You know when you gripe and complain and moan and groan in fear, you're giving glory to the enemy. You're siding against God. You're saying God can't, but the devil can. Now, how foolish is that? The whole army of Israel said, Goliath can. And David said, whoa, wait a minute. He doesn't even have a covenant with God. Who does he think he is to stand up and defy the armies of the living God? He said, I believe I'll cut his head off. Amen? Abraham did not waver at the promise of God, even though what God promised him had never been done before. Amen? He never did see, couldn't say, well, I, let me, oh yeah, I remember so-and-so had a kid when he was a hundred. No. He had no natural inclinations to lean on. So when you fall into divers' trials, stay with the plan. Keep counting it all joy. Keep counting it all joy. <coughs> Keep the switch of faith turned on. Keep giving glory to God. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks. That means in every trial. You know, Jesus said, if you, love, if you just love those who love you, what, what, what difference is that from the unbelievers? If you can only give joy, if you're only joyful when everything's good, what's that? That's, that's being conformed to the world. Isn't it? In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. People say, I wonder what God's will is. He just told you, give thanks. Rejoice. That means in every test, every trial, and not just if everything is great. We're to imitate Jesus, not the world. And you better expect trials because Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. You will have trials. You will have troubles. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. In other words, they won't. If you'll walk with him, you'll walk in victory. Amen? Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil because he had to prove his faith. Can you imagine if the only time he proved his faith was on the day of, that he went to the cross? He'd have never gone to the cross. He'd have never gone to the cross. Jesus, Hebrews chapter 5 says, it was through these testings that Jesus learned to obey God. People think Jesus knew, he learned to obey God. Why? By obeying God. He learned that when God says it'll work, it'll work. Amen? Amen? He learned when God said, don't do that, don't do that. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, it was through these testings that Jesus learned to obey God. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up to heaven prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear... Even though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Having been made perfect. Jesus. John Grannis isn't here, but his grandmother used to always say, let go and let God. And that's exactly what it's saying. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. And now he's able to understand us and to help us when we're troubled. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. God will comfort you if you'll stay with the plan. Hebrews 7.28, For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests by the word of an oath which came later than the law now appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Hebrews 11.40, Since God has provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. We're being made perfect. Do you know there's nothing imperfect in heaven? Amen. The spirits of just men made perfect. God's not perfecting your natural self. He's perfecting your spiritual self. Do you know the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from Father above? Do you know there are no, every good and perfect gift is spiritual? I'm not talking about cars and things there. He's talking about spiritual gifts. One time Brother Hagin was complaining about money. The Lord said, I don't have any money up here. If I had any, it'd be counterfeit. Amen. God gives us spiritual gifts so that we can, he gives us the ability to get what we need here. If any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, or when you lack wisdom, or because you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. The Greek puts it this way. The Greek puts it so that this is from Vincent's word studies. The Greek puts it so that giving is emphasized as an attribute of God. So literally it says, ask of the living God or ask of God the giver. God is the giver. How do you get from God? You ask. You have not because you ask not. God is the giving God. Giving is an attribute of God. Withholding is not. In fact, the Bible says, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Do you know that murmuring, complaining, and unbelief is not walking uprightly? Well, absolutely. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for who doubts is like the wave of the sea. Let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord because he's double-minded unstable in all of his ways let him ask in faith with no doubting we're commanded not to doubt for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind not doubting at all one translation says another says with no doubting another says don't have any doubts Another says, not hesitating. Another says, empowered by confident faith without doubting. The Amplified Bible says, with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. One translation has it literally. That's the Apostolic Bible Polygart. And it says, let him ask in faith, nothing scrutinizing. You know, literally the word doubt, that's what it means. It means, it's the word dicrino, it means to judge. Can God do this? It means to make a distinction, to scrutinize it, to determine, to give judgment. That means, don't try to figure out, can God do this? God can do this. Don't try to figure out how God's going to do it. Because if you try to figure out how God can do it, you're double-minded because God ain't going to do it the way you think. <coughs> Nothing doubting. Don't try to scrutinize. Don't try to figure out, can God do this? With God, all things are possible. To him who believes all things are possible. You see, now you're in agreement with God. Don't doubt, don't worry, don't ask in worry, don't ask in fear, don't ask in unbelief, and don't try to figure out how God will do it.
But let him ask in faith. Asking in faith requires you to get your mind off of the problem and onto God. Amen? We are bombarded today with news of the problems. Aren't we? Just everywhere you look. You want to know the problems? That's easy to find out. Do you want to know the solutions? You've got to get in the Bible. With nothing doubting. How much? Zero. means trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding you know your own understanding will tell you God can't or the devil can you've all been there you got it backwards God can and the devil can't if you're in faith Bible says in all your ways acknowledge him it doesn't matter what's going on acknowledge God he's the answer You know, when Jesus told, or God told Moses, he said, I am. Now, God, you, you want me to, uh, I'm, I'm kind of safe here. You know, I, I know it's not the best thing. I'm on the backside of the desert tending somebody else's sheep, but at least I'm not being killed, you know. <laughs> at least I'm not in jail. Uh, but you want me to, to, to cross the desert and go and rebuke the most powerful man in the world? You got it. That's the plan. I, I don't like that plan, God. You know. If, besides that, I, I'm not even a good talker. That's why I'm sending your brother. He'll talk for you. And he said, well, well, now, well, wait a minute now. Well, they're going to say, first I'm going to go to the people, and they're going to say, who sent you? Who? Now, who said that you're going to set us free? Who said this? He said, you tell them I am said it. The word I am literally means I will become whatever you need. Literally. I will become whatever you need. It doesn't matter what you need. He is. When you put out your faith, when you trust God, He will become whatever you need. But He won't until you believe. Amen? If you want God on your side, don't doubt. Don't waver. Don't murmur and don't complain. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You are the God who is more than enough. You are the God who will become whatever it is that we need. And Father, we know, therefore, we are more than conquerors. And we are being made perfect. And we, Father, we consent to your working in us to will and to do your good pleasure. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. amen.